Good evening, God bless, and welcome back to the Knights of Christendom. I'm Anthony Chioza. It has become what I would consider analogous to a dumpster fire with online Catholic social media. Now, of course, many of you will say it's been this way for quite a long time. And, you know, definitely it's escalated to a place the last 24 months that I think is diabolical. Let's put it like that. And we see violations consistently against the Eighth Commandment. So this podcast has been a long time coming for me. It's something I've been reflecting on quite a while now. And I want to first preface everything I'm about to say with the fact that, like I've said before, anybody can slip up when it comes to the Eighth Commandment, especially if you're casting, you're putting up stuff on YouTube, or if you go live. You know, it's one of those things where the tongue, if not controlled, can become very dangerous for one's soul and for other people's souls that happen to be listening. So, really your tongue, if not controlled, is a weapon. And I don't want to make it seem as if I haven't had my own slip-ups in the past. I have, and I have uh, come clean about those, although they don't get nearly as many views as when I uh, happen to make those initial videos. Uh, People gravitate, it seems, towards scandal, and I suppose that's our fallen nature. Uh, We want to hear all the juicy stuff that's going on. Well, and let me just add to that that this is potentially my last cast at the Knights of Christendom. After I reflect on the Catechism of the Council of Trent under the Eighth Commandment, and really reflect deeply on that, I'm going to discern whether or not this is something I should continue doing. Because as far as I'm concerned, words are incredibly dangerous, not only for my soul, but for other people's soul as well. And one of the things I'm going to have to consider is what has God put in front of me? Because that's what his will is. And God has not put this directly in front of me. This is something I chose to take up in service and love to him. But if I do not do it in a way that is true and proper and loving to God's laws, then I'll be doing more harm than good. Unfortunately, I think we've hit a culmination, really, of the last 10 years of what social media can do to Catholicism, and I believe it's utterly destructive. And so, the first thing I want to do is to take a look at the imitation of Christ, and then we will go through the Catechism of the Council of Trent on this issue. And I'm going to just give you some general thoughts from some of these sections. I'm going to divide this cast up into chapters. So in the description box below, if you look there, you should be able to find a place where this is divided up into chapters or segments. And you can decide to skip forward if you'd like, or skip past. So, I'm going to give you my general thoughts on some of the excerpts from these two books, and then I am going to actually read the Catechism of the Council of Trent in its entirety uh, from the Eighth Commandment. And so, I think that's something that everybody needs to hear. Let me explain why. I, as a traditional Catholic, I've read the Vatican website, the CCC, on the Eighth Commandment. I have read through uh, various other catechisms on the Eighth Commandment. I am of firm belief that the Catechism of the Council of Trent, since this is specifically something that was written for that council, that, and it was written for priests to teach from. And since we have this kind of... uh, ambiguity to just outright uh, loss uh, of teaching and preaching 
the proper nuances of the faith, this is so important when it comes to this department. Because the one thing that the FSSP taught me about the Eighth Commandment was that, you know, a lot of times you're going to be falling into mortally sinful territory when it comes to that. So we're going to be speaking specifically about calumny, detraction, slander. And there are some nuances to this as well that even good traditional Catholics, they think they know it, but then they get online and they say things that go directly against it or they do something to uh, goad somebody else into potentially violating that commandment. So these are important things to really understand well. Moving right along into the imitation of Christ, chapter 28, of those who speak against us. Quote, My dear friend, do not take it to heart if some people think ill of you and say things about you that you would rather not hear. You should think worse of yourself and believe that no one is weaker than you are. If you walk by an inner light, you will not think much of words that are hurled at you. It is no little discretion to be silent in bad times, to turn inwardly to me, and not to be upset by what other people think. Your peace does not depend on what other people say, whether they think well or ill of you. You remain the same person. Where is true peace and true glory? Is it not in me, the person who has no wish to please others, nor who is afraid to displease them, will enjoy great peace? All unquietness of heart and distracted thought springs from having too great a love for the wrong things and from needless fear. There's so much to think about there, especially with the use of social media, right? Because we oftentimes find ourselves upset from the use of social media because somebody has disagreed with our opinion, has verbally attacked us in some way, and it spirals out of control into an uncharitable garbage show. And so... There are things that we can do, practices we can take up that will help us to control our tongue, help us not to care, and really putting social media aside, perhaps for a designated time during the day, and make it a brief period of time during the day. And then take that time that you were using for social media that may have been exorbitant and spend that time reading the saints, the mystics, meditating in prayer, perhaps something other than the rosary if you already do a daily rosary. So these are ways that you can overcome these hurdles that you find yourself facing. And like it says in chapter 28 of those who speak against you, your peace does not depend on what other people say. But oftentimes we are emotionally charged and we care very much what other people think. And if you're like me and you came from a past that was like very rebellious and kind of the um, kiss my behind mindset, kind of a punk rock American rebel attitude, then... It should be even easier for you to not care what people think and to hold your tongue for your master. Because if you really don't care what people think, you are at peace and you don't respond because your relationship is so deep, that true personal relationship with Jesus Christ in the one true holy Catholic church. That relationship is so deep that 
Anything that people say typically will not even phase you. You will feel nothing at a certain point. And then the times where you do have that kind of old reaction that you begin to feel and it gets very visceral and you feel the anger beginning to build, it's very easy to remind yourself, wait a second, there's no reason to let that feeling take over. I'm going to watch that feeling float by like a cloud in the sky because feelings come and feelings go. But we must react and respond to the truth of Jesus Christ and what he teaches. And oftentimes, if words don't anger us, other people's words will hurt us deeply because many times words are like a knife. And when that happens, again, better to perhaps hold the tongue, although we can defend ourselves reasonably. But we'll get more to that in a moment. But maybe better to hold our tongues in that situation and consider the fact that we have probably injured people many times over the same way. What does he say here? You should think worse of yourself and believe that no one is weaker than you are. I think the other thing we have to keep in mind is that When that natural defense mechanism does go up and we feel inclined to, you know, we have that fight or flight response and we want to use that verbally when we feel like we've been verbally attacked. And so one of the things that we get wrong in that, so to speak, is uh, we think that somehow to defend our good name, which we're allowed to do, But we think somehow in defending our good name, it's okay to also hurl detraction and calumny at other people, uh, even tacitly. And I think that's what I want to touch on next, because if you look under commandment number eight in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, under the section number three on offenses against truth, Uh, Just very briefly, well, I'll come back to it. Let me just talk about what, let's stay on task. So bragging or boasting is an offense against truth. Now, this is the important part. So is irony aimed at disparaging someone by maliciously caricaturing some aspect of his behavior. I know Catholics who do this all the time. They say, oh, well, Catholics, you know, you don't have to be nice. You don't have to be nice. And they will repeatedly do this caricature of some aspect of somebody's behavior. I've been guilty of it myself until I looked it up and saw that. So I was like, whoa, wait a second. And you know, it always, it didn't always feel right. Something about it felt wrong. And I think it's because we have to have a love for souls is that's the bottom line. And really when you start doing things that could lead souls away from God, because think about that. Two things here. If you respond with calumny or detraction of your own or by, you know, caricaturing some aspect of somebody's behavior, making fun of them, is that going to lead them to peace? Is that going to lead them to God? Or are they going to be further tempted to return fire on you? And then, you know, you have to ask yourself, do you bear responsibility for that as well? You know, those are some serious things to consider. When we look at the Eighth Commandment, just generally, again from the CCC, quote, respect for the reputation of persons forbids every attitude and word likely to cause them unjust injury. He becomes guilty of rash judgment, who even tacitly assumes as true, without sufficient foundation, the moral fault of a neighbor. And by the way, there's a whole section in the CCC here on how Catholic on how media and Catholic social media is to be used. And it makes it very clear that there's no way you should fall into detraction and what a responsibility, a great responsibility one has to be a part of the media. So we've seen a lot of this where we'll see somebody in Catholic media tacitly uh make some claims about somebody, kind of walk it back, claim it again, walk it back, and then offer no evidence. 
And I suppose they think they're walking a line, but they've crossed it. So that's a big deal under 2477 on offenses against the truth. Quote, of detraction, who without objectively valid reasons discloses another's faults and failings to persons who did not know them. Okay, so you don't go around revealing people's sins. And certainly, even if two people know them, you shouldn't be talking about those sins and gossiping about it behind their back. Of calumny, who by remarks contrary to the truth harms the reputation of others and gives occasion for false judgments concerning them. And so, really, it speaks to itself and goes right along with everything I've been saying. 2478. To avoid rash judgment, everyone should be careful to interpret insofar as possible his neighbor's thoughts, words, and deeds in a favorable way. Every good Christian ought to be more ready to forgive a favorable inter- to give rather a favorable interpretation to another's statement than to condemn it. But if he cannot do so, let him ask how the other understands it. And if the latter understands it badly, let the former correct him with love. If that does not suffice, let the Christian try all suitable ways to bring the other to a correct interpretation so that he may be saved. Now, this is interesting because this is something I learned and I think it's important. It's a way you can handle this type of situation instead of immediately jumping to a negative conclusion about what somebody is saying, a good way to seek clarification is to say, I think I hear you saying this, and, you know, whatever this happens to be, and I would frame it within the positive interpretation that you can make of that statement, if that's possible, and really consider that. And that can really serve to help figure things out. Sometimes the devil likes to play us, especially within marriages or friendships where he kind of inflicts on us a way that he would hear things or he wants us to hear what the other person is saying in a way that's negative or perhaps we've entered into this negative mindset or spiral where we think everything everybody else is saying around us is negative. And so it's good to make sure and check yourself that way, that you're not being misled uh, by yourself or by demons, right? So this is interesting on, all right, well, we'll get to that. 2479, detraction and calumny destroy the reputation and honor of one's neighbor. Honor is the social witness given to human dignity, and everyone enjoys a natural right to the honor of his name and reputation and to respect. Thus, detraction and calumny of bend against the virtues of justice and charity. In 2480, every word or attitude is forbidden, which by flattery, adulation, uh, or complacence encourages and confirms another in malicious acts and perverse conduct. Adulation is a grave fault if it makes one an accomplice in another's vices or grave sin. Neither the desire to to be of service, nor friendship justifies duplicitous speech. Adulation is a venial sin when it only seeks to be agreeable, to avoid evil, to meet a need, or to obtain legitimate advantages. So there are some nuance there. Typically what I learned, though, is that anything under the Eighth Commandment being violated, more often than not, you're falling into mortal territory, if you know, if you have full knowledge. Which, again, it seems to me that traditional Catholics should, if they don't already, and that those that are not in the traditional camp need this information. They need to know it. So they'll be aware that many times these things are mortal sins. Now, I really do want to take more here out of the Council of Trent because this is, uh, this is gold. So the commandment for, this commandment forbids detraction This commandment forbids not only false testimony, but also the detestable vice and practice of detraction, a pestilence, which is the source of innumerable and calamitous evils. This vicious habit of secretly reviling and culminating character is frequently reprobated in the sacred scriptures. With him, says David, I would not eat. And St. James, detract not one another my brethren. And we could keep going, but I think there's just one more section from the Catechism of the Council of Trent that I want to get to here that 
Uh, perhaps some of you don't realize this falls under this sin of the Eighth Commandment, but it forbids flattery. Well, it's okay to say a nice thing about somebody, but what this is referring to is specifically flattering someone for manipulative purposes. Quote, among the transgressors of this commandment are to be numbered those fawners and sycophants who by flattery and insincere praise gain the hearing and goodwill of those who, f those whose favor, money, and honor they seek, calling good evil and evil good, as the prophet says. Such characters David admonishes us to repel and banish from our society. The just man, he says, shall correct me in mercy and shall reprove me, but let not the oil of the sinner fatten my head. This class of persons do not, it is true, speak ill of their neighbor, but they greatly injure him, since by praising his sins they cause him to continue in vice to the end of his life. Now, I want to bring this up in this context because also in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it talks about how the listener, if you, the listener, are indulging in these calumnies and detractions and slanders. But specifically, if you think about what we just heard regarding uh, flattery, when you are frequenting somebody's social media and listening to them and giving them a thumbs up, and, you know, communicating with them via comments, agreeing with them on certain points, when they have engaged in these types of sins repeatedly, you are not doing that person any favors at all. You are really reinforcing that sin, that behavior, and that is something that should be entirely avoided. This is why not only I turn off these channels uh, like I've talked about recently, uh, there's not very many traditionalists that I listen to anymore. There's not very many Catholics I listen to at all anymore, unless they're a priest or a bishop, to be honest. But uh, I turn this off not only for my own sanity, but so that I am not encouraging them so that view does not pop up and they, you know, they'll get that dopamine hit like, oh, I got another view, got another like, got to keep going with this. This is good stuff. You're literally beginning at a certain point, and you know what? Conscience is going to have to tell you when to discuss it with a good priest in the confessional. I'm just a simple layman here reading the Catechism of the Council of Trent and the way I'm interpreting it. It seems fairly straightforward to me that you don't want to reinforce that type of sinful behavior. And just to wrap it up, it has been absolutely devolving into a complete garbage pile the last six months. It's as if we are hitting the culmination of 10 years of this building on Catholic social media, and I have to say I'm exhausted by it, absolutely exhausted by it, which is why I stopped paying attention to it about eight weeks ago now, um, and my life has been all the better for it. Uh, not only Am I getting my normal prayers in? But I'm able to do a good bit of uh, Catholic reading and reflection on other things. So, you know, obviously I am no saint. I have fallen into this sin myself, even on this channel. And it's something that we here at the Knights of Christendom have made a very serious attempt to look at and correct almost immediately out of the gate when we started this channel. You know, we all have our faults. After all, even the Catechism of the Council of Trent says this is a sin that is prevalent among everybody. It almost makes it sound like you can't escape it, to be honest. Um, but that said, we get guidance from the Catechism, and we need to reflect on how do we go about fixing this now that we are aware of it, or we have a deeper awareness of it now. The Catechism of the Council of Trent, the Eighth Commandment, page 418. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Importance of instruction on this commandment. The great utility, nay, the necessity of carefully explaining this commandment 
and the emphasizing its obligation we learn from these words of St. James, quote, If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and again, the tongue is indeed a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how small a fire, what a great wood it kindleth, and so on, to the same effect. From these words, we learn two truths. The first is that sins of the tongue are very prevalent, which is confirmed by these words of the prophet, every man is a liar, so that it would almost seem as if this were the only sin which extends to all mankind. The other truth is that the tongue is the source of innumerable evils. Through the fault of the evil speaker are often lost the property, the reputation, the life, and the salvation of the injured person, or of him who inflicts the injury. The injured person, unable to bear patiently, the contumely avenges it without restraint. The offender, on the other hand, deterred by a perverse shame and a false idea of what is called honor, cannot be induced to make reparation to him who he has offended. This commandment should call forth our gratitude. Hence, the faithful are to be exhorted to thank God as much as they can for having given this salutary commandment, not to bear false witness, which not only forbids us to injure others, but which also, if duly observed, prevents others from injuring us. Two parts of this commandment. In its explanation, we shall proceed as we have done with regard to the others, pointing out that in it are contained two laws. The first forbids us to bear false witness. The other commands us to lay aside all dissimulation and deceit, and to measure our words and actions by the standard of truth, a duty of which the Apostle admonishes the Ephesians in these words, doing the truth in charity, let us grow up in all things in him negative part of this commandment. With regard to the prohibitory part of this commandment, although by false testimony is understood whatever is positively but falsely affirmed of anyone, be it for or against him, be it in a public court or elsewhere, yet the commandment specifically prohibits that species of false testimony which is given on oath in a court of justice. For a witness swears by the deity, because the words of a man thus giving evidence and using the divine name have very great weight and possesses the strongest claim to credit. Such testimony, therefore, because it is dangerous, is specifically prohibited. For even the judge himself cannot reject the testimony of sworn witnesses unless they be excluded by exceptions made in the law or unless their dishonesty and malice are notorious. This is especially true since it is commanded by divine authority that in the mouth of two or three every word shall stand. Against thy neighbor. In order that the faithful may have a clear comprehension of this commandment, it should be explained who is our neighbor. Against whom is it unlawful to bear false witness? According to the interpretation of Christ our Lord, our neighbor is he who needs our assistance, whether bound to us by ties of kindred or not, whether a fellow citizen or a stranger, a friend or an enemy. It is wrong to think that one may give false evidence against an enemy, since by the command of God and of our Lord we are bound to love him. Moreover, as every man is bound to love himself and is thus in some sense his own neighbor, it is unlawful for anyone to bear false witness against himself. He who does so brands himself with infamy and disgrace, and injures both himself and the church of which he is a member, much as the suicide, by his act, does a wrong to the state. This is the doctrine of St. Augustine, who says, Those who do not understand the precept properly it might seem lawful to give false testimony against oneself because the words against thy neighbor 
are subjoined in the commandment. But let no one who bears false testimony against himself think that he has not violated this commandment. For the standard of loving our neighbor is the love which we cherish towards ourselves. False testimony in favor of a neighbor is also forbidden. But if we are forbidden to injure our neighbor by false testimony, let it not be inferred that the contrary is lawful, and that we may help by perjury those who are bound to us by ties of kinship or religion. It is never allowed to have recourse to lies or deception, much less to perjury. Hence, St. Augustine in his book to Crescentius on lying teaches from the words of the Apostle that a lie, although uttered in false praise of anyone, is to be numbered among false testimonies. Treating of that passage, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have given testimony against God that he hath raised up Christ, whom he hath not raised. If the dead rise not again, he says, the apostle calls it false testimony to utter a lie with regard to Christ, even though it should seem to redound to his praise. It also not infrequently happens that by favoring one party, we injure the other. False testimony is certainly the occasion of misleading the judge, who, yielding such evidence, is sometimes obliged to decide against justice to the injury of the innocent. Sometimes, too, it happens that the successful party, who by means of purged witnesses, has gained his case and escaped with impunity, exulting in his iniquitous victory, soon becomes accustomed to the work of corrupting and suborning false witness by whose aid he hopes to obtain whatever he wishes. To the witness himself it must be most grievous that his falsehood and perjury are known to him whom he has aided and embedded by his perjury, whilst encouraged by the success that follows his crime. He becomes every day more accustomed to wickedness and audacity. Thou shalt not bear false witness. All falsehoods, in lawsuits are forbidden. This precept then prohibits deceit, lying, and perjury on the part of the witness. The same prohibition extends also to plaintiffs, defendants, promoters, representatives, procurators, and advocates, in a word, to all who take any part in lawsuits. False testimony out of court is forbidden. Finally, God prohibits all testimony which may inflict injury or injustice, whether it be a matter of legal evidence or not. In the passage of Leviticus, where the commandments are repeated, we read, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, neither shall any man deceive his neighbor. To none, therefore, can it be a matter of doubt that this commandment condemns lies of every sort, as these words of David explicitly declare, Thou wilt destroy all that speak a lie. This commandment forbids detraction. This commandment forbids not only false testimony, but also the detestable vice and practice of detraction, a pestilence, which is the source of innumerable and calamitous evils. This vicious habit of secretly reviling and calumniating character is frequently reprobated in the sacred scriptures, with him, says David, I would not eat. And St. James, detract not one another, my brethren. Holy writ abounds not only with precepts on the subject, but also with examples which reveal the enormity of the crime. Ammon, by a crime of his own invention, had so incensed Assurius against the Jews that he ordered the destruction of the entire race. Sacred history contains many other examples of the same kind, which priests should recall in order to deter the people from such iniquity. Various kinds of detraction. But to understand well the nature of this sin of detraction, we must know that reputation is injured not only by culminating the character, but also by exaggerating the faults of others. He who gives publicity to the secret sin of any man 
in an unnecessary place or time, or before persons who have no right to know, is also rightly regarded as a detractor and evil speaker if his revelation seriously injures the other's reputation. But of all sorts of calumnies, the worst is that which is directed against Catholic doctrine and its teachers, persons who extol the propagators of error and of unsound doctrine are guilty of a like crime. Nor are those to be disassociated from the ranks of evil speakers or from their guilt, who, instead of reproving, lend a willing ear and cheerful assent to the calumniator and reviler. As we read St. Jerome and St. Bernard, it is not so easy to decide which is more guilty, the detractor or the listener. For if there were no listeners, there would be no detractors. To the same category belongs those who cunningly foment divisions and excite quarrels, who feel a malignant pleasure in sowing discord, deserving by fiction and falsehood the closest friendships and the dearest social ties impelling to endless hatred and deadly combat of the fondest friends. Of such pestilent characters, the Lord ex expresses his detestation in these words, Thou shalt not be a detractor nor a whisperer among the people. Of this description were many of the adversaries of Saul, who strove to alienate the king's affection from David and to arouse his enmity against him. This commandment forbids flattery. Among the transgressors of this commandment are to be numbered those fawners and sycophants who by flattery and insincere praise gain the hearing and goodwill of those who favor money and honors they seek, calling good evil and evil good, as the prophet says. Such characters David admonishes us to repel and banish from our society. The just man, he says, shall correct me in mercy and shall reprove me, but let not the oil of the sinner fatten my head. This class of persons do not, it is true, speak ill of their neighbor, but they greatly injure him, since by praising his sins they cause him to continue in vice to the end of his life. Of this species of flattery the most pernicious is that which proposes to itself for object the injury and the ruin of others. Thus Saul, when he sought to expose David to the sword and fury of the Philistines, in order to bring about his death, addressed him in these soothing words, Behold, my eldest daughter, Merob, her will I give thee to wife, only be a valiant man and fight the battle of the Lord. In the same way the Jews thus insidiously addressed our Lord, Master, we know that thou art a true speaker, and teachest the way of God in truth. Still more pernicious is the language addressed sometimes by friends and relations to a person suffering with a mortal disease, and on the point of death, when they assure him that there is no danger of dying, telling him to be of good spirits, dissuading him from confession, as though the very thought should fill him with melancholy, and finally withdrawing his attention from all care and thought of the dangers which beset him in the last perilous hour. This commandment forbids lies of all kinds. In a word, lies of every sort are prohibited, especially those that cause grave injury to anyone, while most impious of all is a lie uttered against or regarding religion. God is also grievously offended by those attacks and slanders which are termed lampoons and other defamatory publications of this kind to deceive by a jocose or officious lie, even though it helps or harms no one, is notwithstanding altogether unworthy. For thus the apostle admonishes us, putting away lying, speak ye the truth. This practice begets a strong tendency to frequent and serious lying, and from the jocos, lying men contract the habit of lying, lose all reputation for truth, 
and ultimately find it necessary in order to gain belief to have recourse to continual swearing. This commandment forbids hypocrisy. Finally, the first part of this commandment prohibits dissimulation. It is sinful not only to speak, but to act deceitfully. Actions as well as words are signs of what is on our mind, and hence our Lord rebuking the Pharisees frequently calls them hypocrites. So far with regard to the negative, which is the first part of this commandment, positive part of this commandment. Judges must pass sentence according to law and justice. We now come to explain what the Lord commands in the second part. Its nature and purpose require that trials be conducted on principle of strict justice and according to law. It requires that no one usurp judicial powers or authority. For as the apostle writes, it were unjust to judge another man's servant. Again, it requires that no one passes sentence without a sufficient knowledge of the case. This was the sin of the priests and scribes who passed judgment on St. Stephen. The magistrates of Philippi furnish another example. They have beaten us publicly, says the apostle, uncondemned men that are Romans and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privately. This commandment also requires that the innocent be not condemned, nor the guilty acquitted, and that the decision be not influenced by money or favor, hatred or love. For so Moses admonished the elders whom he had constituted judges of the people, Judge that which is just, whether he be one of your country or a stranger. There shall be no difference of persons. You shall hear the little as well as the great. Neither shall you respect any man's person, because it is the judgment of God. Witness must give testimony truthfully. With regard to an accused person who is conscious of his own guilt, God commands him to confess the truth. If he is interrogated judiciously, by that confession he, in some sort, bears witness to and proclaims the praise and glory of God. And of this we have a proof in these words of Joshua when exhorting Achan to confess the truth. My son, give glory to the Lord the God of Israel. But as this commandment chiefly concerns witnesses, the pastor should give them special attention. The spirit of the precept not only prohibits false testimony, but also commands the truth to be told. In human affairs, to bear testimony to the truth is a matter of the highest importance, because there are innumerable things of which we must be ignorant unless we arrive at a knowledge of them on the faith of witnesses. In matters with which we are not personally acquainted and which we need to know, there is nothing so important as true evidence. Hence the words of St. Augustine, He who conceals the truth and he who utters falsehoods are both guilty, the one because he is unwilling to render a service, the other because he has the will to do an injury. We are not, however, at all times obliged to disclose the truth, but when in a court of justice a witness is legally interrogated by the judge, he is empathetically bound to tell the whole truth. Here, however, witnesses should be most circumspect, lest trusting too much to memory, they affirm for certain what they have not fully ascertained. Lawyers and plaintiffs must be guided by love of justice. Attorneys and counsel, plaintiffs and prosecutors, remain still to be treated of. The two former should not refuse to contribute their service in legal assistance, when the necessities of others call for their aid, they should deal generously with the poor. They should not defend an unjust cause, prolong lawsuits by trickery, nor encourage them for the sake of gain. As to remuneration for their services and labors, let them be guided by the principles of justice and of equity. Plaintiffs and prosecutors on their side are to be warned not to be led by the influence of love or hatred or any other undue motive into exposing anyone to danger through unjust charges. 
all must speak truthfully and with charity. To all conscientious persons is addressed the divine command that in all their interactions with society, in every conversation, they should speak the truth at all times from the sincerity of their hearts, that they should utter nothing injurious to the reputation of another, not even for those by whom they know they have been injured and persecuted. For they should always remember that between them and others there exists such a close social bond that they are all members of the same body. Inducements to Truthfulness In order that the faithful may be more disposed to avoid the vice of lying, the pastor should place before them the extreme lowness and disgrace of this sin. In the sacred scripture, the devil is called the father of lies, for as he stood not in the truth, he is a liar and the father thereof. To banish so great a sin, the pastor should add the mischievous consequences of lying, but since they are innumerable, he must be content with pointing out the chief kinds of these evils and, and calamities. In the first place, he should show how grievously lies and deceit offend God and how deeply they are hated by God. This he should prove from the words of Solomon, six things there are which the Lord hateth, and the seventh his soul detesteth. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked plots, feet that are swift to run into mischief, a deceitful witness that uttereth lies, etc. Who then can protect or save from severest chastisements the man who is thus the object of God's special hate? Again, what more wicked, what more base than, as St. James says with the same tongue by which we bless God the Father, to curse men who are made after the image and likeness of God, so that out of the same fountain flows sweet and bitter water. The tongue, which was before employed in giving praise and glory to God, afterwards, as far as it is able, by lying treats him with ignominy and dishonor. Hence liars are excluded from the participation in the bliss of heaven. To David asking, Lord, who shall dwell in thy tabernacle? The Holy Ghost answers, he that speaketh truth in his heart, who hath not used deceit in his tongue. Lying is also attended with this very great evil that is an almost incurable disease. For since the guilt of the calumniator cannot be pardoned unless satisfaction be made to the calumniated person, and since, as we have already observed, this duty is difficult for those who are deterred from its performance by false shame and a foolish idea of dignity. We cannot doubt that he who continues in this sin is destined to the unending punishments of hell. Let no one indulge the hope of obtaining the pardon of his calumnies or detractions until he has repaired the injury which they have inflicted on the honor or fame of another whether this was done in a court of justice or in private and familiar conversation. But the evil consequences of lying are widespread and extend to society at large. By duplicitly and lying, good faith and truth, which form the closest links of human society, are dissolved. Confusion ensues and men seem to differ in nothing from demons. How to Avoid Lying the pastor should also teach that loquacity is to be avoided. By avoiding loquacity, other evils will be obviated, and a great preventive opposed to lying, from which the loquacious persons can scarcely abstain. Excuses for lying refuted. The plea of prudence. There are those who seek to justify their duplicity either by the unimportance of what they say or by the example of the worldly wise who they claim lie at the proper time. The pastor should correct such erroneous ideas by answering what is most true, namely that the wisdom of the flesh is death. He should exhort his listeners in all their difficulties and dangers to trust in God, not in the artifice of lying, 
for those who have recourse to subterfuge plainly show that they trust more to their own prudence than to the providence of God. The plea of revenge. Those who lay the blame of their falsehood on others who first deceived them by lies are to be taught the lawfulness of avenging their own wrongs and that evil is not to be rendered for evil, but rather that evil is to be overcome by good. Even if it were lawful to return evil for evil, it would not be in our interest to harm ourselves in order to get revenge. The man who seeks revenge by uttering falsehood inflicts very serious injury on himself. The pleas of frailty, habit, and bad example. Those who plead human frailty are to be taught that it is the duty of religion to implore the divine assistance and not to yield to human infirmity. Those who excuse themselves by habit are to be admonished to endeavor to acquire the contrary habit of speaking the truth, particularly as those who sin habitually are more guilty than others. There are some who adduced in their own justification the example of others who they contend constantly indulge in falsehood and perjury. Such persons should be undeceived by reminding them that bad men are not to be imitated, but reproved and corrected and that when we ourselves are addicted to the same vice, our admonitions have less influence in reprehending and correcting in the others. The pleas of convenience, amusement, and advantage. With regard to those who defend their conduct by saying that to speak the truth is often attended with inconvenience, priests should answer that such an excuse is an accusation, not a defense since it is the duty of a Christian to suffer any inconvenience rather than utter a falsehood. There remain two other classes of persons who seek to justify lying, those who say that they tell lies for the sake of amusement, and those who plead motives of interest, claiming that without recourse to lies, they can neither buy nor sell to advantage. The pastor should endeavor to reform both of these kinds of liars. He should correct the former by showing how strong a habit of sinning is contracted by their practice, and by strongly impressing upon them the truth that for every idle word they shall render an account. As for the second class, he should upbraid them with greater severity, because their very excuse is a most serious accusation against themselves, since they show thereby that they yield no faith or confidence to these words of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added to you.